sort of walk in the footsteps of some of our geological forebears, uh, those who started the science, those who uh, developed the science, and there is a lot of information. I mean, that this could, we could spend a week in, in Edinburgh and, uh, and into the Highlands and have a great geology field trip. So this field trip's a little different than most trips I'm used to in the sense that normally we go look at a, a set of rocks or rocks of a given you know, carbonates or Permian Reef complex or Paradox Basin, that type of thing, book cliffs. This trip is probably 80%, 20% about the actual rocks and 80% about the people who looked at them and what they did and, and the observations observations they made and the principles that they developed from that. So today um, is the general overview. I won't go into too much detail on any one individual or any one concept. Give you sort of a sense of, of what the trip will entail. So you can see from the, the title, Plutinus, Fossilus, Students of the Strata. Uh, these are terms that are a little But it, it speaks to some of the terminology that they apply to themselves. For example, Murchison, Sedgwick, others referred to themselves as the students of the strata. The term stratigrapher hadn't even uh, developed yet. So Scott, did you get interested in this with the history of geology taught by Bob Dylan? Well, he certainly was had a lot of interesting things that he did, but I, I don't know. Just, did you take that class? I think I got it from Morris Peterson. Because he'd always tell the sort of stories about these folks. So, so like I said, we, we ran this trip in 2013. And the way we did it last time was we showed up at London, and we had a bus full of students, and we took a, a circuit that went more or less like that, ending up back in London. Then uh, we kicked the students off the bus, cleaned it out, and that took quite a bit of work. And then we picked up the alums, another bus load, and took another 10-day trip and went to, through it uh, a second time. And then we checked Dr. Ritter into an institution. <laughs> <for> <laughs> and on that trip, we really, really, really wanted to get the students, get the folks up to Sikar Point, way up here in, in Scotland, because that's so in between trips, Randy and his wife got there, and we jumped on a train one afternoon in London, went up to Edinburgh, stayed overnight, rented a car, drove out to Sikar Point, back on the train, came back down. That's when that other group showed up and did the second, second circuit. So anyway, um, we decided this time we're going to include Sikar Point, which means that we're going to start in Edinburgh this time, and meet there, and then we'll go out to Sikar Point, and then, uh, actually I don't think we return, I think we head, start heading south to England uh, from Sikar Point. Yeah. You know, if we had time, we could go over here to Dobbs, over here to Dobbs Lynn, which is the global section strata type and point now mm -hmm. for the base of the Ordovician. Mm -hmm. And uh, we won't, uh, I don't think we'll have time to do that, but, so once we get done, we'll spend a day in Edinburgh, um, some time at Sikar Point, then we'll have a long bus trip. And we'll uh, go to Cambridge, and then work our way, well, I'll, I'll come back, get back into a little more detail that as we go along. But that, that's the trajectory of, of the trip this time. So if we zero in on the part that's just been highlighted. So we'll go to Cambridge. There's some interesting things to see there. Then we'll make our way over to the Welsh borders to Shrewsbury. We'll go to Birmingham on the way, uh, see where William Smith's gravesite is. We'll stop in the lovely little town of uh, Dudley. And then we'll head over to Shrewsbury. And then we're in the Welsh borders, which is the, where the type Silurian is. Take a look at some of the stuff that Murchison did, including the town of Ludlow. Then we'll make our way 
past Malvern, down to Bath, Chase William Smith sites, and other things around there. Another question, isn't the Cambria, is Cambrian also named after Cambria Lane Wells too? Yeah, this was, this oh, was. So we won't get anywhere close to that. No, yeah, that, and it's a, it's a different trip. You know, if we really wanted to do a real detailed geology trip, we just go along the coast where you can actually see everything, right? So, then we'll head to Bath, and then from there, after we spend a day or a day and a half, day two there, head down to the Dorset Coast, or the Jurassic Coast, as it's also called, the Lyme Regis, and then off to London, to down, to, you know, we don't have time to go to the Eclipse of Dover. Some of you will be staying in a little town called Beer, which is just a little bit to the west of Lyme Regis, and there's actually a downfall to chunk along the seacoast where, sea where we can see some chalk. And then to London for a couple of days, and then um, we're gone. So in s this is a biostratigraphic chart, but instead of having fossils on it, uh, got some of the folks that we're going to be thinking about. So uh, here is a here are some of the folks whose footsteps we will tread in: William Smith, Mary Anning, Hutton. Rod, uh, Murchison, Lyle, Darwin, Buckland, Sedgwick, De La Beche, Richard Owen, and we'll intersect with others uh, along the way. But you can see that what we're looking at are ma mainly developments that were taking place from the late 1700s uh, through pretty much the 1800s. And you notice that there are different colors on these uh, bars. So the red bars reflect or refer to, to the, the common folk. So these were now were, were mainly going to be there during Regen Regency England, and the class system was huge, right? <coughs> so gender was an issue, your social status and life was a huge issue. Here's a peasant, here's an, an orphaned yeoman. Um, and so at, because of who they were at that time in British history, they, were, they had an uphill battle in addition to just trying to uh, be good scientists. So Mary Anning, who's probably one of the greatest fossilists ever, William Smith, will have a, an entire lecture or two on William Smith going, going forward. In addition to the poor, the Po folk, there were also the aristocrats. So these are people who were wealthy enough from their upbringing and from their family situation that they never had to work a day in their life. And they became interested in this new science that James Hutton had started called geology. And so Murchison, Lyle, Darwin, Hutton fall within uh, that classification of aristocrats. <coughs> then there were the university folks and William Buckland who published the first dinosaur discovery, who first geolo geology professor at, at Oxford. Then there was uh, Adam Sedgwick who was his counterpart, one of the early geology professors at uh, Cambridge. And of course, he's the uh, author of the Cambrian system. We'll spend some time uh, taking a look at, at the work that he did. Then about that time also, it, be, it was just starting to dawn on people that this knowledge was of significance and utility, and so there were government institutions that developed. So uh, Henry de la Beche was the first director of the uh, Geological or the uh, Geological Survey of Great Britain. Richard Owen was a, an anatomist, but also a very influential uh, scientist and paleontologist, and he was the founding director and designer of the Natural History Museum in London, and we'll go take a look at that. Plus, uh, he was the one who coined the term dinosaur, so that's that term we ascribe to him. So we'll see some of the influence that, that these folks had.
know, again, we're in England, and so there's this concept of heraldry, and very important people would have family crests, and quite often, or coat of arms, quite often they would have symbols that reflected who they were, or great accomplishments ma they had made. They would have animals on them, and then they would have in, in uh, Latin. What this means is that virtue conquers um, violence, okay? So that was the sentiment that that person wanted to convey. Here's another one, this time in French, God is my right, and lion, you have the, must have been very important, you know, the lion being that symbol, here's fanciful unicorn, then the chain, and you know, all this other stuff. Now here's the crest that was developed for the Royal Hammerers. This was the crest for the, the coat of arms for the Geological Survey of Great Britain, and this was drawn in 1849, so if you look at that, you can see that uh, the shield in this case is a trilobite, and then it's got the tools of a geologist, got the arm and hammer up there, the ichthyosaur on this side, the leather belt, plesiosaur on that side and the dress, and then in these curly cues, here are sea ur fossil sea urchins that were drawn in there. So. And then it says in here, you know, science and, and uh, utility, basically, or science and, and application. So, anyway. So, there are the characters that we want to become familiar with. In addition to that, we want to put them, be able to put them in the context of the time they lived in. There's also the geology of the island, or the area that we will be in. And so that, I've been teaching historical geology now for more years than I care to think about, but we mainly focus on North American geology. So, you know, there's a lot to learn about just the geological history of the British Isles. So this is my placeholder for, for that. We'll have a lecture down, down the line a little bit later, maybe we'll have Mike do that go through geologic uh, history or geologic evolution of the British, British Isles. But currently, if we look at a geological map, in the area that we'll be in, well, we unfortunately won't be out in Devonshire or too far into Wales, but these are the outcrops of Paleozoic rocks. These are Devonian plutons from, the Acad from this side of the continent, the Acadian orogeny. There's a coal basin of South Wales. And so a lot of very complex geology here from different mountain building events. So these basement rocks are twisted and turned. And then overlying that with an angular unconformity, dipping three or four degrees back to the southeast, are the Mesozoic strata. And the, you can see the, the, the topography here is basically reflecting the underlying stratigraphy. So here it is a gently dipping ridge hogback called the Cotswold Hills. And uh, if, if you ever want to get together and give me a, buy a Christmas gift for me, buy me a little Oolite stone cottage in the Cotswold Hills. Okay. Just a little. Just a little. So you can see the outcrop there, and then clay veils or shales, and then another limestone, and then here are the Cretaceous chalks. And you can see that the chalks and all these things have been folded here in the wheeled anticline. And so there's really spectacular geology also. Like I said, we'll, we'll try and pick that up as much as we can see. We'll see some key outcrops that have some stratigraphic uh, relations and fossils and other things. So we're going to start in Scotland, and uh, three out of the uh, four landed gentry here were in fact uh, Scots by birth. So James Hutton, Murchison, Lyle. In the rotunda of the 
uh, museum in Edinburgh, I can't remember which museum it is, but there's this painting that sort of big mural that's got all of the leading Scott scientists in it, or gentlemen of, of character. And if you take a look at that, you can see Roderick Murchison here, Sir Charles Lyell here, and then other movers and shakers of the, of the uh, Industrial Revolution and so on. So we'll start in Edinburgh. And uh, what we're, we're looking up at the uh, Edinburgh Castle here, and then the Royal Mile coming down from that. Uh, beautiful uh, city with, again, we could, we could spend a week in Edinburgh looking at a variety of things, including the cultural history, the architectural history, the geological history, go to the museums and, and other things. So we have, I think, what, a, a day? most of a day to take a look at things. Okay, so here's the castle sitting up on top of a Carboniferous intrusive. We turn the other direction. Uh, this is Holyrood Park. These are the Salisbury Crags. Does that ring a bell with anybody? Anything Salisbury Crags? And then Arthur's Seat, so mythic in mythology, this is where King Arthur used to hang out. But James Hutton developed the concept of Plutonism by looking at these outcrops. And that was in direct conflict with the widely accepted concept of Neptunism, that all rocks, what we call now igneous sedimentary metamorphic, were, were laid down in a universal ocean. They are all sedimentary. So that was the Neptunists. But uh, Hutton had data and had observations where he said, no, some of these rocks are, were, were, were uh, molten and they came up from, from beneath. So we'll have a chance to take a stroll through Holyrood Park and, and take a look at some of these pivotal seminal outcrops. We'll then leave Edinburgh oh, right along. This is the Firth of Forth. And right along here, there was, a miss there was, before they paved it over, an outcrop of Mississippian stromatolites. And that is where the conodont animal, the, the specimens of the conodont animal that were found came from right there. It's now paved over. It's called the Green Shrimp Band. So then we'll get in the bus. And you can see the scale up there. We'll go about 25 miles out here, just east of North Berwick and walk out across this lovely meadow and then take our lives in our hands going down this steep clay slope and end up at Sikar Point. And if you go down the slope, you have to come back up the slope. <laughs> they haven't set it up as a park or anything? No. Uh -uh. And I didn't think we were going to get Tom Chintzy back up to the cars. Because <laughs> his, his was, knees were wearing. It was a group effort to get Tom Chintzy back up that hill. But there was Tom and his wife, Janie, you, me, yeah. and Chintzy. Tom had his wife there. But, so, I mean, here's the famous uh, angular unconformity that, that Hutton was looking for. John Playfair, a chemist, and his biographer was on that trip as well as two or three other important people. But, uh, so we'll have an opportunity to uh, take a look at that. The red sandstone that's on top? Or? Right, yeah. So these are slurry and strata down here, and then the old red development on, on top of that. Then we'll make our way uh, down to southern England and spend a night at Cambridge. And Cambridge, critical place. This is where Sedgwick worked out of. And we'll go to the Sedgwick Museum. And it ha it's a pretty, pretty spectacular museum, a lot of good stuff. We'll have an opportunity to go to the Wren Library. And of course, there was a, what was that guy's name? Newton, is that his name? The, Talk and I'm sure worked, you're talking about. did research there. So we'll go to the Wren Library, and we'll be, if it's still there, I assume it will be, under a glass case on a little pedestal is a copy of Principia, his, his book, and it's the first edition, and it has his scrawlings for comments or for modifications for the second edition. Uh, that's pretty overwhelming to sit there and, you know, makes you feel like, you know, what have I done? <laughs> 
So we'll also, Darwin went to Christ College in Cambridge after he failed, flunked out at uh, Edinburgh in medical school. And we'll have a chance to go to, Ki hopefully the timing will be right, we can go to King's College Cathedral, which is just a beautiful cathedral. And I think it's around 6 p.m. they have Evensong. And Darwin talks about, as a student, trying to go to Evensong as often as possible. So they have this, this devotional, this choir sing in the evening. It's just, it's, it's really, really neat. So the Arctic Research Center is, the, anyway, there are a variety of things that we'll see when, when we get to Cambridge. Then we'll jump back on the buses, head to the northwest towards Shrewsbury, where Darwin was born. And on the way, we'll stop at Birmingham, or Mayor Mayfair, and, and look to see uh, William Smith's grave. We will stop at the little town of Dudley and do a couple of kind of fun things there. I'll show you a picture here in a second. Then on to Shrewsbury. Don't get in the boat with Scott. <laughs> He's talking about Dudley. <clears throat> then, then we'll head down. This, so this is the Welsh Boards. This is the type Silurian. This is where Murchison cut his teeth as a geologist and determined that he could, he could make something of himself or make a name for himself. And so Ludlow is certainly the center of Silurian land. Then we'll head down past the Malvern Hills, uh, Stowe on the Wold, where we'll first encounter the Cotswolds, down to Bath, spend some time there, down to Lyme Regis, and then a couple of days in London. So in terms of uh, Silurian, uh, or Roderick Murchison, he uh, was referred to as the king of Siluria, which he didn't mind a bit. Um, pretty Well, we'll get into him later, but anyway. Here's uh, Archibald Geike's memoirs of Sir Roderick Murchison, then here's his famous book, uh, Murchison's Siluria. And this is a sequel to uh, the Silurian system that he published earlier. And here's a map that came out of that book, uh, The Silurian System. This one just sold for 5,000 pounds, so first edition. So the Silurian region, he did the mapping here. You can see which part of England we're, we're looking at. Here's Wales, Welsh borders. He, at least at this point, because this was early on, he at least, he still called this Cambrian. Later he referred to this as Silurian, but we'll get into that later. So as we're driving across the countryside, this is in the Wolverhampton up here, the little town of Dudley right in here. You'll notice that there's this little, what looks like a teardrop shaped park in there, a little hill. This is an anticline, and it's called the Wren's Nest Anticline. And on the flanks of it are exposed, um, Silurian Strait are exposed along the flanks of that. So here's, here's some dipping Silurian carbonates. And if you get up real close, you can see that these are just loaded with fossils. And one of the local fossils is what they call locally the, the Dudley bugs. Uh, this is a, a type of Silurian, the genus is calamine there. But the people who work the quarries around here, they would labor for a week for minimal wages. If they found one or two Dudley bugs and sold them to collectors, they could make twice their weekly salary from a single fossil. I think Lisa was the only one who found one of those when we were there. And she loitered it over Tom something here, yeah, so it was fun to watch. So one of the things we'll do when we're there, there there's a canal, there's a quarry underneath the, the anticline where they pulled resources out. So the way to get in, the way they get in, the way we'll get in there is you get in this canal boat and you go in and there's this in the early part of it anyway, where it's close, it, you can see they paved it the, with brick. And the way you, you get through that, they have motors on these, but the way that the miners would get in is you'd lay on your back and you'd walk along the walls of the, walk along the, walls of the tunnel, and that would propel you through. In fact, it works part, really well if you're both the same height. Yeah, Randy and I got to walk the boat out, and he's been complaining ever since. But. So here we can see going under in, under the anticline, and here's where there's a breach, and then it goes under the other part, and these are st 
steeply dipping straight in. Murchison himself, with lanterns all aglow, all aglow, got under there and gave one of his big talks on the Silurian system underground there. So we'll have, we'll... Not dramatic at all. Yeah, we'll go take a look at that. <laughs> um, let's see. Didn't uh, Murchison like all his field work do in like uh, uh, dress as well? And kind of Full of robes and... and yeah. Um, Scott does that on the field trip. Yeah. <laughs> Wear my top hat and <laughs> coattails. Murchison, so Mur well, we'll get to him later. So, okay. But, so here's the Welsh borders Much Wendlock, Ludlow, the town of Amistry. Bill, this is right along here, River Y, is where he first sort of conceived the concept of the Silurian and that he saw enough stuff that he felt like he could make a contribution because. Sedgwick, who had gotten him involved in this, was starting over here working his way from the Precambrian upwards. Uh, Murchison started at the base of the Devonian, although one named that yet, and worked his way down. And so they were working that simultaneously. But this is the little town of Amistry. This is Reverend Lewis and his daughter. And if Murchison's the father of the Silurian system, then he is the grandfather of the Silurian system. Long before Murchison ever decided to go take a look at the rocks in that area, amateur fossil collectors had been working the area for generations. And Lewis had an incredible collection of fossils, and he knew where all of them were from. And so he, when Murchison visited with him, Murchison, he got, Murchison got a lot of his information from him. Just like when he went to Russia to work on the Permian system, he stood on the shoulders of people who had been working there for decades. And that's why, after just being there for three years, could write a big book on the Permian system, because a lot of it really was based on things other people had done. So so the Silurian, in its type locality, is broken up into four stages. Thandavari, Wenlock, Ludlow, Predolian. Where do you think the names come from? Well, here's there's a little town there along the edge of a beautiful limestone hogback called Much Wenlock. And that's the type Wenlockian. There's the town of Ludlow that we will visit. And that's the type Ludlovian. Right? So we're right there, right where these things were named, right in the middle of the Type Silurian. This is the village of Ludlow, and there's a medieval castle in the middle of it. It's built sort of on a hill, comes up from the river up to the high points there. Lovely little village, good, good pasties. This is a famous place called Ludford Corner, and right about there follow it around, there's, well, you can see it here, there's a thin band in the limestones, it's a clay that has been quarried back by generations of geologists, starting with before Murchison. <laughs> I have a little piece of it, but it's called the Ludlow Foss, the fish bed, and it's a little um, phosphatic lag with lots of, of, uh, of vertebrate material and conodont material in it. And so, you know, this is the world famous type locality for the Ludlow bone bed in which fragment remains of primitive fish are abundant. Marks the beginning of a change in this region about 400 million years ago from open seas to extensive land areas with large rivers. Roderick Murchison in 1839 placed the fish bed near the upper limit of his Silurian system. So this would be up in the uh, Predolian. And there's a museum in Ludlow and we'll go in and take a, take a look, but if you go in, take a look at the guest registry. Oh, shoot, where is it? Um, if you look closely, and I should have looked where I came, oh, um, you can see where, where Sir Roderick and Lady Charlotte Murchison signed in when they visited the museum back in the 1830s. And then inside the museum, They have it under plastic, so it's hard to get a good photo, and it's been been uh, aging for you know 200 almost 200 years now. But these were 
posters that Murchison hand drew to show the stratigraphy and structure around Ludlow. Um, and he would take that when he'd go on his empire building trips to try and show how important the Silurian was. He, those were, he'd give his evening lectures and those were important props for him. And then you can see that they, they know that Murchison is important in Ludlow and there are some fossils and other things. So here, here are the cross sections that he hand drew, you know, those on large scale to get his point across in 1852. Then we'll head down <coughs> along the Severn River to make a quick stop in Malvern. Do any of you like Lee and Perrin's Worcestershire sauce? This is the type of locality of Worcestershire sauce. Okay, Lee and Perrin's factory is there. We don't have time to go to it, but this is where Darwin would go to take the water <coughs> cures. And this is where his daughter Annie, where he took her to get cured and it didn't work. And this is where she's died and is buried. Then there's some interesting stuff in the Malvern Hills too. Then we'll go across the Severn Vale and up onto the Cotswolds. We'll stop in Stowe on the Wold where uh, William Smith was born just over here in the little town of Churchill, but he got his first job essentially here and that job led him down to Bath where he really made a name for himself, started, showed and developed the concept of faunal succession where he developed the first geological maps and where he did a lot of geological engineering. So there are really three things that, that he did well. So final succession, geological mapping. Have, it, have any of you or all of you read the book called The Map That Changed the World? Um, you ought, to, you ought to get a copy of it. You can download it. You can even listen to it if you have an Audible or something. Map that changed the world by um, Simon Winchester. So that'd be a good one. In fact, I will give you a reading list for all these different people or, you know, things. I mean, you, you could, I'm starting to panic right now thinking I, I have, I don't have nearly enough time to read everything I need to read before we go. So. Start reading. So when we get to places, oh, well, I read this, or tell us what you know. So this is the beautiful little town of Stowe on the Wold. This is where Edward Webb had his sur his family lived here, but this is where his surveying business was, and he's the one that hired hired uh, met uh, William Smith over in Churchill, hired him, and then eventually sent him down to Bath to survey the, the coal holdings on a certain uh, wealthy family's uh, farm. And that led to the construction, the digging of two parallel canals in the vicinity of Bath. So here, oh, each of these little dots is a colliery or a coal mine or a seam comes close to the surface. This is all before Paleozoics. There's a real distinct line of demarcation where you get into the gently dipping Mesozoics. And they needed to get this coal, the most, the most costly part of coal was shipping it. So they needed a way to get the coal from these little mines to the big markets in London. And the way they did that was to hook up with the the Avon Kennet Canal and then get it into the Avon River and take it over to Bristol and then they could move it relatively cheaply. So these canals were built along two parallel brooks, the Cam Brook and Wellow Brook. They met up at Midford and then continued as a single canal. And he had the good fortune of being the engineer and uh, surveyor for that. We'll visit uh, the home that he was uh, not really given, but he, he was allowed to live in this beautiful stone building for, for a very few, uh, a very small amount of money. It was owned by the woman whose property he was surveying and who owned the Mirrods Colliery where he cut his teeth. Um, there's a sign here, just down there. We back out and go down about 100 meters, there's a little country road and this winding <coughs> driveway that goes up 
and at that junction, the base of the driveway, there's this sort of grown over sign. It says to Rugborn Farm where William Smith, father of English geology, lodged from 92 to 95. This was under restoration the last time I was there. But a family had already moved in, and they had restored it, but they understood the, import, the historical geological significance of the building. So they tried to keep everything inside as close to the same as it was back in the day, although they added some important improvements. But we'll see if they're nice enough to let us on the property this time. But Rugborn Farm is a critical spot. What's a giant house? What? What's a giant? It's a, yeah, it's three stories. In, in, there's another building just like that that's attached to it on the back side. There's one other gentleman that was leasing part of it, so he didn't have it all to himself. But and it had a stone wall around it now that it's uh, gone. But you know, so he he'd walk out in the morning, get on his trusty horse, and have be confronted with that beautiful countryside. This is the valley of the Cam Brook. This is looking towards the east. This is looking west. So he would start up there on that end. Now you don't see very much rock here. So it was critical that they were digging these canals across here because that opened it up. He could see every, every stratum, every layer, every fossil, that, uh, or exposed fossils. Anyway. So the collieries, these were relatively small things, although they could dig down as deep as about 500 feet. Technology had allowed them to pull water, groundwater out and to get things up and out. But uh, we'll go to a coal mine, the Somerset Coal Museum in Radstock. And when we were there last, they, they <coughs> changed this every year. They had a display. The display they had there were children of the mines. And they, they had the list of how many children died in the mines and how they died. And, and these so are like seven-year-olds. Yeah, yeah. I mean, being a miner was tough, tough work. And it would start early. Here are some. Uh, legacy images of the canal at Dunkerton. And here it is farther down towards the, the canal at Moncton Coombe. This canal, there's only a, a very small part of it that's left at the very end before you get to the end at Kennet Avon. Um, because when the canals went out of vogue, here was this already flattened spot that was just perfect for trains. So he's filled in the canals and built train tracks. The last train went across this region in about 1960, much to the chagrin of the locals who loved their, their trains and so on. But canal boats are still a big deal. Some people have this as a hobby. They'll buy a canal boat and that's where they'll live. And you can see this one, the Calisto on the Somerset Coal Canal. This is a spot that uh, where William Smith would hang out when he wasn't up in, in Bath. He had a home that he rented about here, another one that he purchased along the canal route. We'll see that when we're on a hike there. But this is the Swan Inn at Dunkerton, where he would uh, stay from time to time and where some of the some very pivotal uh, concepts came to him, or at least he, he wrote them down for the first time there. They said, we'll try to go through Northampton. This is, this is where William Smith uh, is, is interred. Then we'll head, um, we'll head south to the Dorset coast, to the lovely little town of Lyme Regis and take a look at some of the things that Mary Anning saw and did. Here's this, all of, the, all of this is a, a World Heritage Site along the coast. They call it the Jurassic Coast, but going from Devonshire over to Dover, the rocks are gently tilted to the east, so Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous, as you go farther to, to the east. She's one who found the first ichthyosaurus when she was 12 years old. But Here's uh, sunrise along the Dorset coast. And when there were wars brewing on the continent, revolutions taking place on the continent, the, the royals in Brit 
in England didn't feel safe going there, so this is one of their favorite uh, place, places to go vacation. Just around the corner of a little cottage where, um, oh, who's the authoress that I'm trying to think of? Give me the name of a famous British author, female of the 1800s. Wrote Persuasion. Jane Austen. Jane Austen, thank you. Jane Austen stayed in a little spot just around the corner from here. And in one of her books, uh, she writes about uh, some of the, some of the uh, action takes place in Lyme Regis. And uh, this is where Mary Anning lived. This is the top of a museum, the Philpott Museum, that now commemorates her. But her family lived right here down by the coast, and half their house got washed out to sea when some big winter storms came in at one point. So we'll tell her story when we're down there. Go out onto the Monmouth Beach. Wasn't it originally Roman? Like any Roman? In Bath, we'll see some Roman ruins. Yeah, yeah. There's definitely Roman stuff. Like, like we we yeah. could do a week of just looking at Roman stuff. Well, Jane Austen has a house in Bath that's now a yeah. museum as well. Yeah, we'll also go in Bath to William Herschel, the Herschel Museum, where William and his and sister found Uranus. That's correct. Right. <laughs> they did in the backyard. In the backyard. In the backyard Uranus. of that little what they now have. It's their little watt. Their little apartments yeah, there three story or they made really high-end uh, lenses for uh, telescopes they're the first ones to discover galaxies and yes they did they just they, they found Uranus in their backyard okay. so we'll go to the uh, sharp oh, what is her name William and the name? sister of the wife yeah, this is his, his sister so here's, here's Mary Anning's actual fossil extractor. This is what their home looked like. So when we were there last time, that wasn't on display. And we, Janie and myself, talked to the curator at the Philpott Museum. Yeah. And he said, it's no longer on display because about three years ago, somebody identified it as a World War I entrenching tool. Oh. And they don't think it's... Yeah, that's why they took it off display because all these pictures well, thanks are a lot, Randy. and they look like a, <laughs> <laughs> ah, a killjoy. <laughs> <laughs> well, when everybody gets there and it's not there anymore, they'll hear the same story. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Janie can get into closed doors. Okay. <laughs> so this is an outcrop along that we'll see along the Dorset coast. This is the lower Jurassic Blue Lias understand, under, underlies the, uh, the uh, blue lights there. This is relatively deep marine. It's got beautiful fossils. These bedding plains are, are littered with uh, big cephalopods. And sometimes when there's a recent storm and stuff gets with, there was a group two years before we got there that found an ammonoid that was that big. This is where the first flying reptiles were found, weathering out of the cliffs by Mary Anning. Lots of fishes, plesiosaurs, ichthyosaurs, lots of ammonoids, and so on. And you gotta love towns. So this is called the Blue Lias, and there's a gallery in town called the Blue, you, you gotta love a place where geology sort of infuses itself. And we're gonna see that all over England. You'll be able to tell where you are to a degree just by the architecture and the building yeah. materials. Because the local, the, you know, they, they build from what's there. So in the chalk area, lots of flint from the weather, the, Silicious uh, nodules that are weathering out, or in the Cotswold Hills, or the whole city of Bath is essentially built of this Jurassic honey-colored oolite, which is just absolutely beautiful. In Lyme Regis, on the streetlights down in the main part of town, there's these sconces that look like cephalopods. So they do; they infuse the geology into everything. Yeah, yeah, I thought I had them there. So then we'll head to London. This, these are Mary Anning specimens that are now in the British Museum of Natural History. And any town that has a footprint smaller than BYU campus and has four fossil shops, you know that is a good town. This is where Mary Anning is buried, up on the hill behind. If you walked right there and and kept going, you'd fall off a 50-foot cliff. So the, the Jurassic cliffs are right there. 
This is called the Mary Anning window, which is a stained glass window that was put in the church in honor of her. Sometimes you'll see this littered with fossils that people come from the blue lines down below. And what? It, and most of them are from the blue but, lines yeah, down below. People, people you go down and get a, a fossil, bring it up, and leave it on Mary Anning's headstone. And then her brother Joseph is buried here as well. She died at the age of 47 of breast cancer. So we'll tell her story before we get there. And then from library, just depending on the time, we'll, we'll stop at Salisbury Cathedral. Lots of cool fossils. Yeah, lots of cool building stone, plus a, uh, an original of the Magna Carta. We'll go past Stonehenge and take a tour of Stonehenge. You can't break off pieces of that, Mike. Just so then we'll <laughs> go to London, and this is where Darwin's home, the Darwin family home, uh, where he wrote The Origin. And you can see this anticline, wheeled anticline, pretty critical in the history of dinosaurs, but I don't think we'll have a lot of time to do that. So, so here's an 1817 map of London, and it has changed a lot, as you might uh, surmise. Um, so this is almost a, almost like another individual. That you, I mean, the town itself, the history of, of the town of London, the things that are there, are worthy of a lot of time, but that we don't have. We will hit a few spots. So this is St. James Square, where the Athenaeum Society met. This is where uh, William Smith lived when he had quarters in. London for a period of time before he went to debtor's prison over here. Unfortunately, well, uh, anyway, unfortunately from a history point of view, those buildings are no longer there. This is where the Geological Society of London was at the time after having moved from Queen Street. And this is the Admiralty Building. The current one is over Piccadilly Square. Off of Piccadilly. And that's the one that that we'll visit, but there are a variety of things to uh, rock. <coughs> Murchison had a place on in Belgravia, which was a high-end place on the east side. There's the so this is Burlington House, and there's a plaque on the outside right about here. So this is now where the Geological Society is. I used to go into the society by going through this these, through this archway, and then there was a door in here, and you knock and you could get in if you're a member. Yep, they really don't like it when people who aren't members come in. But ever since ever since Simon Winchester wrote the book about the map, people who have gone to London have understandably wanted to go see the map. So when Kathy and I went there in 2007, I think it was, we knocked on the door. It felt like the Wizard of Oz where you <coughs> knock and they open it and who, you know, and then give you a bunch of grief. They, they said, no, you can't come in and see it. I said, well, really? Is there no way, you know, we can come back if it's inconvenient. They said, okay, come back at 2 o'clock. We got there at 2.02 .02 and they said, you're late. We said to be here at 2. <laughs> anyway, they let us walk back in. Nowadays, they understand, you, know, you knock on this door, or it's open, you walk in, you can go, go see it. But Don't even touch your camera. Do not. So if, Don't worry about it. Yeah, they do not like you. You take a picture of it, and three people will gang tackle you. I still have a bruise. I think they might. Maybe I don't know. We'll see. But the front door, the front of the building we just looked at, right here. You can that door. So here's a copy of William Smith's map, along with the marble bust. Here is the competitive. He grief about joining the society, like he wasn't. He wasn't good enough. Yeah. No, they wouldn't let him. But after debtor's prison. But, George Bellis Greenoff went to his that home of his on the Thames River and purloined or, or pilfered the information that he had, and then they started working on a competitive map, which sent Smith to debtor's prison. It wasn't until much later that he was given the credit that was due. Well, he will also jump on trains, planes, and automobiles and make our way down to southeast London to the Crystal Palace in Sydenham. So this is a big shield-shaped area that was the place for the Great Exhibition in 1852. And the Crystal Palace was up here. It burned down. How glass and wrought iron burns down, I don't know. 
But down here on the grounds for the fair, they had a geology exhibition. Can you let us eat one of the meals in one of the <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so here's the Crystal Palace. And it had stuff from all over the British Empire, and that was the whole purpose of it, to show off how great the British Empire was. And a bunch of the stuff that was in there caught on fire, and so the thing was gone. Nowadays, if you go there, all you can see are a few of these little arched uh, things here. The grounds are still there. The sidewalks are still down, way down at the bottom of that shield. So here you can see those little arched units here. And they have a little thing showing what the construction was like. But if we walk down the hill a couple hundred meters, you can see that uh, geology was important during the World's Fair. In the star of the show, sorry Greta Thunberg, but the star of the show was coal, because that was the that was the engine, if you will, or the fuel for the Industrial Revolution. But they also had down there these <coughs> cement models of dinosaurs as they were understood at that time. <laughs> and the plesiosaurs and other things. And um, what Riley was referring to was when this one was half completed, let's see if I have a closer, no, it's, no, that's, that's this isn't source. the right one, but, but it, it was, uh, it wanted on. it wanted on. But when it was half done, they hosted a dinner inside, had a table set up in Lyle and Murchison, a bunch of people paid $1,000 or pounds to sit there and eat and contribute money to it. It's a cool picture. And then, then we'll also head down to the World Heritage Site, uh, southeast of London, and down, and finish our discussion of Darwin there. Yeah, yeah, back to the house. Yeah, so we'll have a chance to, anyway, do a variety of things in London, and we'll have a, a couple of evenings, or at least one evening, where you're free. And if you want to go to the theater district and go see the 39 Steps or, you know, do some, or some other thing cultural, I don't know, maybe Eric Clapton will be at the Opera Museum or something. But London's yeah. theater district's incredible. Yeah, it is pretty cool. When we went to Downhouse a couple of years ago in December, <laughs> and it snowed a couple of inches and they were calling it snowmageddon. <laughs> People were panicking. We couldn't get a taxi out there. Hire a that driver. That's funny. At least the weekend drive in snow. And, and it was literally two or three inches, five centimeters. <laughs> yeah. Never has so little been done by so few to <laughs> yeah. help you get where you needed to go. Okay, so we're out of time. That's a, a, a sort of a quick overview of where we're going and some of the things and some of the people okay. we'll be chasing. So, quest any questions? What did you call the class? Geology, what? The history of geology. History. Yeah, it's Geology 490R. I mean, I don't know. But I like history of geology, sounds good. So if there are people, are, are things you're interested in, bone up on those things, and if you have some things to contribute, we would love, love, love that. The more you put in, the more you're gonna get out of it. Outside of geology, or? Yeah, whatever, right? I mean, if, if you're a aficionado of Scottish history and you know everything about Edinburgh, and, and the tell, Royal us, Mile. tell us some interesting things, you know, that'd be awesome. So flying buttresses. Yeah, and we'll have time on buses. You know, if you want to get up, there's a microphone. There you can. There are numerous flying buttresses. They're we'll ubiquitous. We'll be near Winchester. Winchester? <coughs> yeah, we'll go in there. We'll go and see where Lyle and Newton and Darwin oh, are yeah. buried. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think. Again, we'll we'll see a lot, and we'll see it in a in a hurry. And there'll be more things that you would want to see, but Just this will be at least wet wrap type. We'll do this every Wednesday? We'll do this every Wednesday from 4 to 4.50. Okay. okay. Thank you. And I'll give you a syllabus next time. I'll tell you All what right. we're doing. Thanks. Uh -huh.